Hey everyone, welcome to this next part or parts on Meditations on the Tarot, a journey into Christian Hermeticism. Now, uh, anyone who's been following this series will know that I've been tackling it one card at a time. Um, and that's worked thus far. However, as I was doing the research, as I was doing the reading, uh, on these most recent cards, it's become more of a struggle to be able to follow the co coherent line that we've been following in relation to singular dialogues. Uh, on, on, on these clear ideas that we've been looking at and this sort of thread which is throughout the whole text but has started to waver near the end. Now that thread has been in relation to the above and the below, in relation to the legitimacy of the above and the falsity from the below and we've seen that in various different ideas. Electricity and friction in the below, the ideas of crowns from the above but as we hit card 15 uh, which was the devil coincidentally you may have noticed that the a lot there was there was a lot less sort of content coming in because actually anyone who's reading this book's realized that after this card the, it, the the whole tone the whole style of the book really changes now i've done as much research and looked in all the places that are available to me to try and find out why this could be but the history behind this book is fairly odd anyway i mean we've we're fairly certain even though it's generally often published as anonymous, uh, many pl places now will actually publish it under uh, Valentin Tomberg, who we pretty much know Valentin Tomberg wrote it. Now, the story goes that Valentin Tomberg was writing this, he died, and he he said, look, he sort of left a note to say, don't do anything with this. In fact, I think he might have even gone as far to say, burn this, like burn his work. Now, complete conjecture and no proof behind this, but my personal theory now is that after card 15 and the cards that we're going into, because of the the ginormous and excessively excessive reliance on quotations, and I mean like paid now they're getting page and a half long quotations, um, I f it just comes across and feels like what we're looking at is he's understood that he wants to write on this card and he's right he's written you know a couple of pages on one thing that he wants to do about it and then a couple of pages on another thing and these have been edited in a way where they somewhat fit together but no way near as seamlessly as they did in the previous cards not even close and it even though in the earlier cards the ideas were quite jarring they all used to cohere at the end into something you go oh i can see how that relates back and now that's not really happening anymore as far as I'm can see. It's a bit unfortunate and I, I do I do just personally think that maybe it wasn't entirely finished in that way. I'm sure some scholar could either tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. But either way, these cards are a struggle in terms of finding that thread that we can use um, because there's a lot more just dragging in random things and going off on a three or two, two or three page tangent on something which then just stands on its own and these talks would become basically me just going through random ideas and that's how these later cards come off which is why basically that is the big reason why uh, this is now a two parts so this two parts will be free and then the next two parts uh, which will be uh, 19 and 20 will be for patrons and then I'll see when I get to the end how I'll do those, but it'll probably, um, hopefully I can just do those as singular parts. And maybe in the last part, I'll just go over my thoughts on the, on the cards. But so I'm tackling the star and the moon together, basically because, uh, you know, and I have no real defense for this, <laughs> because I just couldn't find the thread nowhere near as easily and coherently in relation to what we've been talking about uh, as I did in the previous cards. And it, uh, maybe other people will read the book and say that I've completely missed something and I, and I hope they do. Um, but maybe other people, some of the people who've been following along this series and talking talking about it with me in the Discord, have said the same thing that they they've also been reading the book and they've uh, they they're wondering what's going on with these cards. But but either way, we'll we'll jump in. So we're, we're this is card seventeen, which is uh, Lestor, uh, the star, and then uh, card eighteen, La Lune, the moon. So we'll begin with card seventeen, uh, the star. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They still bring forth fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. Psalm 92, 12, 14. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Emmanuel Kant. So the previous card, 
uh, show that there is a decision between the alternatives of construction and growth. The difference between uh, the construction from below in relation to the Tower of Babel and <clears throat> the growth which is legitimately afforded to us from above. So now this has been understood, we are given this decision upon our way of growth. And this card, the star, is a spiritual exercise devoted to growth. For instance, um, a tower like the Tower of Babel, is built bottom-up, uh, upwards. You know, that's the whole point of the Tower of Babel story, is that people of the below were trying to build a tower upwards to get to heaven, but that can never be, I mean, that's just not how it works anyway. But, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to invert the relationship of legitimacy. And, you know, a tower is built, a tree grows. And they both have a tendency to go upwards and increase in their size, but the tower for the author, it rises in with, with leaps and bounds by these artificial jumps. While the tree grows in a, in a continuous slow elevation, the tree itself multiplies through a division and growth with respect to its cells. Whereas the tower is built by heavily putting bricks laboriously atop one another in this very jarring building process. The growth of the tree uh, is possible because its roots are embedded in the trunk and the branches it's deeply rooted in and it, and it shoots up in a multiplication okay but the tower the ultimate difference between these two is the tower is dry and the tree is filled with sap okay so in relation to this sort of this wetness this inner sap growth flows okay um whereas because the construction being dry is this is this dry haphazard leaps and bounds process okay so an, a theme that we're really looking at then is this theme of what the author considers to be the universal sap of life this water of life in relation to this natural growth okay in the same way that there is for the author some agent which affects the passage from imagination to reality that that growth that creation there is no less than a mysterious agent which affects the passage from seed to maturity, basically potential to realization. And the, the, the agent, the agent of transformation from the ideal to the real, that the, 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 the acorn to the oak tree, uh, the ideal to the real, and thus of growth, but it's this slow natural growth. And this is this peculiar agent of change, which is filled with this, this, this um, uh, sap, this odd sap, this, this water of life, really. And uh, such an agent for the author is necessary to posit, to put forth, as it affects the transition from one state to another. Okay, there's this transition stage which isn't building blocks, and something must act during this time to make an acorn or a seed transform into that which it's going to transform into, you know. Uh, or even for the author, he goes as far to say a primordial mist into a planetary system. This can't be the building of that... That the, the building blocks of the jarring form of the Tower of Babel of below, there has to be this agent of change. And so here we be, begin, we can begin to see two different types of, 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 of agent, actually, in relation to this. Okay, We can begin to see that there's obviously two different types of agent in relation to the below and the above, which we've been looking at. Okay, Firstly, there is a magical agent of an electrical nature who is either terrestrial or celestial. Okay. This is, as we can probably understand by now, an agent of friction, an agent of emission, an agent of sparks. It's dry, it's warm, it's got a nature of fire, but it's not the fire of, you know, the fire of the Lord. Okay, so this is the agent of, um, this is like, uh, yeah, friction, fire, electricity that we've seen before. Whereas angelic inspiration and the agent, uh, angelic inspiration and the agent of growth, not uh, building, have a commonality with water and flowing. They don't act through shocks, discharges, friction, like bricks and building and hammers and slamming and all that. They act in a continuous way. This is the other agent. Okay, so continuous transformation is the agent of growth and both have... A, a sort of creative principle within them, okay? So these two types of agent are basically manifested everywhere. They're, they're, they're even inclusive within the human intellect. There are minds which have sided with the water, and there are minds which have sided with the fire, okay? There's been many attempts to try unify these two sides in some way, uh, which the author understands is the equivalent of actually trying to unite the Catholic and Reformed churches. It's, you know, it's a, it's a unity of, really it's a unity of trying, it's trying to unify unity, and schism, you know, growth and electricity doesn't happen because they, they, they're beginning from uh, completely different axioms. And so in relation to, 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 to spirit, to have grasped this agent of growth, the author says we can't pass by um, 
a great spirit. We have to sort of start in the heaven of perennial philosophy. Ultimately, we're looking at the principle of continuity, um, a mode of thought which is grasped, uh, which is grasped grasping movement by moving with it and not arresting it which is actually something we'll, we'll see in the next card so the big difference between these two these two cards and really they, they almost act as a pair to be honest the star and the moon is to do with this idea that as there is growth or change which ultimately is movement for for people who are for people who have to abide by senses okay time and space things move through them it's once again back to that difference that we saw in the garden of eden of uh, moving with just moving with movement and thus actually allowing movement or understanding movement only by arresting it okay you grab something you say right this is here that's the difference between growth and building okay and so the author here cites Henri Bergson the philosopher and he cites him so much from now on in his book The Creative Mind who invites us to cross the agent of growth in action and instead occupy ourselves you know uh, with 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 like fossilized products, okay, inviting us to experience intuition, which we'll talk about more in the next card in this same talk, okay. So this intuition relates to a difference between these two forms of fire and water, okay. So we have a celestial fire of, um, so these two forms of fire and water, but we actually have, we have two forms of each. We have two forms of fire. We have fire of divine love, which we all know very well. It's the purgative and loving fire of God, which is one and the same. We also have the fire of electricity due to friction, and he capitalizes the, the higher. There's also the water, which is celestial, and that internal sap of growth that we saw, progress and continuity. But there is also the, the lower water of the collective unconscious, which is like the, 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 the herd mind, uh, which is like a flood, and it drowns people. Okay, So we can think back to the card of the woman with two vases, which blend into the same stream. Uh, this is the tragedy of of human life because one can see if they they think of these two forms of water this is really really the tragedy of this human life is is in a form of blending in that way okay and so we we're seeing again uh a dualism between a yes and no once again back to that section in matthew you know is it going to be a yes or a no um and i guess in relation to abiding by the continuity and allowing allowing movement to be movement as you move with it to move with it uh is, is the difference between choosing the movement or choosing the act of grasping, okay? Uh, and growth in terms of fossilization or allowance of movement, okay? So it's a yes towards the eternal spirit, you know, the thing which is just always moving things, but it's a no towards the transitory things of matter and the below, which in which you're grasping them. But this this 17th card is not, the star is not only that of, of the water which flows from the two vases and mixed into a single flow, it's also obviously that of the star. The central star of the card invites us to contemplate justice with active justice, uniting the principle of understanding in the principle of the will. Um, it invites us to overcome a dualism and actually move away from, uh, well, move away from a form of complete division and towards a marriage of opposites. And it's this marriage of contemplation and activity. You know, contemplation and activity is effort and grace in a way, the antithesis and the thesis with respect to the idea of hope. So between this marriage of opposites in this synthesis is an idea of hope. Okay, Hope then is taken objectively in relation to the general concept of light in relation to a star, and this hope then moves spiritual evolution within the world. And so far as it moves it, it is objective. It's, it, is the, it is the hope which moves the thing itself, and it's not in that act of grasping. And insofar as it orientates the movement in the world, it is subjective because it's in relation to the will. But once again, it is hope only in that combination of contemplation and activity. So it's like an activity of passivity in relation to something higher. So in this sense, hope becomes the final cause of the world, the, 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 the force and the light of the ideal of the world. Okay, It is hope then that brings forth a unity, which is the aim of the spiritual exercise of this card. Okay, So... The essence of the spiritual exercise then is to contemplate biological growth and the essence of spiritual growth together, to contemplate growth and hope in order to find their kinship, okay? Searching for the essence of water which flows with respect to growth and coming to an intuition of this water with respect to the idea of parting of the seas, okay? So um, there's water which flows with respect to that personal spiritual growth, growth, but there's also the water in relation to the idea of the parting of the seas, which is, of course is something so much more, something, something so much higher, something that needs to be 
allowed and it's in relation to intuition which this comes about okay so it's necessary to obtain an intuitive perception that the principle of this internal uh, internal sap this internal water and the principle of hope are one and the same namely they are the principle of the water the transformation of both these things is in conformity with the divine okay um and in this sense, it acts in a sphere which is above consciousness. And, and this sphere will actually become more articulate. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to articulate it better when I talk about the next card in a little in a little bit. Um, so while the agent of growth in biological evolution acts in the sphere beneath. Okay, so these, these two things, which is once again that sort of compulsion and understanding that things have to be worked out in the worlds that we are given. But at the same time, to solely work in the blow and thus just go with that is that act of grasping. And so you have to work in that world with your human will and your human senses. But you have to allow them a relationship, an intuitive relationship with something higher, something legitimate, a sphere above, as the, the author is saying, which allows the continuity to not just be of yourself and not just be of the below. Once again, a clear difference between like a friction, a, a building and a growth. But then that growth has to like imbue itself within the human. Okay, so that's in, 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 in this way, the two truths, because they're true with, with respect to their own domains, aren't they, of science and religion, uh, is a marriage of contradictions. Okay, it's a marriage of opposites, but they're no longer no longer contradictory because they bear a single message of hope in a synthesis of salvation. Okay, so both together in the fact that you know, in a very simple way, uh, the soul is not necessarily conforming, but it has as its means the body, the the below, the body of the below, the flesh, which is weak, um, and that's the only way that it can grow grow itself and so it has to be this marriage opposites towards salvation and that's what we're talking about with hope um but in looking at these two sides of things um you know salvation on one side and almost evolution on the other the above the below we go back to the idea of um divine magic and the human will or divine magic and arbitrary magic and we realize that, that, that there has to be a difference in a way between um arbitrary magic and what we understand to be miracles right that, that clearly has to be because we're talking about evolution would be arbitrary magic the human is building something and um salvation would be miracles something coming in from the 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 above but we don't really have a say in that whereas um so what we're looking at in the sense of a miracle the action of the forces are removed from the human will okay it's uh, it's indifferent to the aspirations of the of the human will and lends its power to the realization of of that higher those higher forms that we're talking about those higher forms that you're giving yourself over to in the pursuit of salvation and hope okay so it's it's the sense that a miracle is um indifferent to the human will but it, it and its actions and forces are removed from the human will but in some sense it still might be acting on the laws of the below and it's in a way up to the human to give themselves over to this um and Divine magic, therefore, is, is that which invokes the help of the higher conscious, uh, consciousness, setting in motion the agent of growth, right? Back to that agent of change. And neither science nor personal arbitrary magic can, of course, perform miracles, okay? They only set laws against one another, like we've seen in that sort of cause and effect way. And they, they're just always reduced to the, the below. And in the act of knowledge, then, science only proceeds in the visible moment from the invisible causes, so the, the, the agent of growth is really from the above. So science does the empirical thing, but it doesn't actually know the causes. They're invisible. And so in its act of realization and experimentation, the results proceed from their, from the invisible forces to a visible moment. And so science is this circle. It's a snake eating its tail because it never really forms a relationship with the above or even allows the above. Okay, You have these invisible causes. It never questions them. It experiments and does tests from the invisible causes and has visible results and what does it do it does what i was talking about right at the beginning it grasps those results and considers them to be the absolute truth as opposed to the actual growth motion which is pushing them forward okay so the circle's closed in science it doesn't want to open itself to something higher and it conflates truth uh with the thing that it's captured um it's ultimately a prison okay a captivity for the spirit okay um and so science um, only really renders controllable this, like the secret invisible forces of nature um, once it's like rendered them basically impotent by its own recursive logic. 
okay? Um, and anything which then enters into science in that way, enters into captivity, um, it's a false eternity of the blow because it's a snake eating its tail, okay? So this closed off circle is, it doesn't have a door anymore as when we looked at the open and closed circles before. So when Christ says, I am the door, he's ultimately proclaiming that there is an exit from every closed circle and from all the spirit that's ever been captive. You know, John John 10, 9, I am the door, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Is basically that there has to be, once again, that synthesis that we spoke about where the below, I mean, we have to work with the below, but it enters firstly into a relationship of almost like a cosmic spontaneity where it allows. And in, in that sense, it has a door and thus it begins to form a relationship with the invisible and that's actually being able to understand the visible properly. So heaven opening then is a way into a spiral into the infinite. Okay, the spiral is un understood in relation to the marriage of spiritual and biological growth. It is the vertical and horizontal form of growth proceeding in a spiral. You need them both, right? Of course. As we said, it's like the slow ascent up the cross where you have the vertical of the cross and uh, uh, and then you slowly go up from the horizontal so you have to be on the horizontal as well, and so you slowly ascend. But if you look at that in three dimensions, what you're looking at is a spiral that's going up, because you need both. Um, so um, the star, basically, is the agent of growth. It's a principle of this um, spiral, spiralatic evolution in the sense that it engenders the spontaneous light of hope forthwith, reflecting it in the flowing waters of below into biological forms of growth and then realizing that spiral. And that's what the light of the star does. And amidst this idea of fairly simple idea that the light of the star is reflected in the waters of the below and thus is imbued into biological life. Thus you have the legitimacy of the beloved and the legitimacy of the divine in the above reflected in the waters below, imbuing itself into biological growth, meaning the synthesis of the spiritual and biological growth, allowing the spiral, okay, spiral of, spiral of ascent. But amidst this coherent idea in this uh, talk in the book is 101 other things which are just really do just seem thrown in there. So sorry, Tom Berg. But these, these cards were frustrating, so which is why we were doing the two. But I'm glad we've done the two, because actually they work very well as a pair, which leads us to the 18th card, okay? The 18th card, uh, the moon, la lune, and begins once again with some uh, gospel quotes and other quotations, okay? God forbade Lot and his family to look back, but Lot's wife behind him looked back. She became a pillar of salt, uh, Genesis 19:26. David's heart smote him after he had had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly on what I've done. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel. 2 Samuel uh, 24. And then finally from Henri, Henri Bergson, Our intelligence, as it leaves the hand of nature, has for its chief object the unorganized solid. Of the discontinuous alone does the intellect form a clear idea. Of immobility alone does the intellect form a clear idea. The intellect lets what is new in each moment of history escape. It does not admit the unforeseeable. It rejects all creation. The intellect is characterized by a natural inability to comprehend life. But it is to the very inwardness of life that intuition leads us. By intuition, I mean instinct that has become disinterested, self-conscious, capable of reflecting upon its object and of enlarging, its, uh, enlarging it indefinitely. Very, very peculiar stuff. So in this card, we're tackling the problem of retrograde movement so everything that we've just spoken about in the last card in terms of going forward and having a, a relationship of hope salvation and positive growth forward we're now talking about a retrograde movement an inversion of this movement in the sense of the moon okay the moon is the antithesis of the star if the star invokes ideas feelings impulses of the will in relation to growth uh, concerning infinite development because you're in just you're just you're just with motion and not capturing it. The moon inv evokes inversion and envelopment, you know, folding inwards and holding, which we've spoken about before. So instead of the current which flows in the previous card, we find when we look at this card, a stagnant water and a swamp uh, with two rigid stones either side of it. And this is the author's description. Instead of a naked woman, like we had with a star, we find an enveloped 
crayfish at the bottom of the basin and two dogs which are banging at the moon above instead of a radiant constellation of stars we find a darkness of total eclipse um now what we're doing we're meditating here the spiritual exercise is a meditation on that which arrests evolutionary movement and growth that which arrests that growth that we've spoken about what is creating an inversion uh, a spiritual devolution if you will the purpose and point of the eclipse as a as a symbol uh, for the author is that uh, it would be present it would exist and active on all of us even if the devil and all his demons uh, stopped stop doing what they're doing okay it would be present after all lessons are learned it would still be there okay the, the very the very essence of an eclipse is that it's eclipsing everything um, it is always going to be opposed on us by its very definition by the fact we exist the moon is the principle of reflection as it reflects the light of the sun. So too does human intelligence reflect the creative conscience. Okay, so um, what is happening with this reflection of the moon in eclipsing us? Uh, you can think of eclipses, you know, covering, smothering, veiling, holding. What is really happening with the light of this reflection being reflected about and thus coming down in the same way the stars does stars do? But it was also it's also stopping the light right is entering our intelligence only into materialistic intellectuality and thereby entering our creative endeavors of the below only into materialistic intellectuality which is to say uh that from the last card one of those possible synthesis sides of the growth is ripped out okay so in relation to this idea of light uh reflecting light the cards that we're really talking about the sun the star the moon and the sun are above intelligence creative consciousness and we're asked to think about what the the, the, the state of intelligence would be this is a big question really especially in relation to all the bergs and stuff he mentions what would the state of intelligence for man be if he was deprived of the environment of the material world and in relation to the work of bergson who the author is as i said just talking about constantly we he talks about in the relationship between intelligence and matter or in intellectuality and materiality, materiality as a recomposition, a reflection, okay? The abilities of us to render matter um, malleable, okay? Uh, being able to divide it, being able to create with it in that, in the, in the not a dualistic sense, but a synthetic sense of intellectuality and materiality, okay? Uh, for us, for the author, um, matter and intellectuality is like, is like fish, it's like water for a fish or air which the bird flies in okay we absolutely need it we need to enter into this relationship of matter in a creative sense in a simple way of being it just has to be okay and he, he quotes bergson the universe and years the more we study the nature of time the more we shall comprehend that duration means invention creative forms the continual elaboration of the absolutely new so the moon as an exercise then has only as its aim to evoke the conscience desire to go further than intelligence now the moon itself like doesn't want to do this but that as an exercise we need to understand that we're almost like looking back at the previous card and understanding that the intelligence needs to make that leap that we spoke about with the higher sphere the intelligence needs to make that leap to leave its sphere to something higher to be into a, in accordance with something higher and we from this we, we, we're just constantly looking at the idea of intelligence and matter or intellectuality and materiality okay so the intellect is only at ease or at home when it is at work with raw matter, uh, materiality, and especially solid objects. And, and from this, you can see that once we begin to deconstruct objects, decomposing them, the author says, into their chemical elements, um, so, so too does the science of spirituality decompose because it's almost like elusive as to what we're even working with um, at all. And in this manner, intelligence represents to itself only the discon uh, discontinuous um, and, and, and then, therefore, its reasoning represents motion to itself as if it were discontinuous, as if it were just a momentary physical object. It makes motion that which is motionless, okay? It constantly is creating a sort of stagnant relationality between uh, uh, physical objects. So when we talk about that decomposing of things, the thing is no longer allowed in its in its motion in accordance to the progress and duration of it, of everything, but you're like right, bang, rip it out, grasp it, hold it, and it's a 
its motion become motionless because you are in our intelligence we are constantly reasoning reasoning it in a in like a relationality which is just stagnant that 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 right this is composed of that 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 okay and basically the author says this is like a film role okay the whole of all of motion is like just looking at a role of film and seeing it in, in segments basically going back to Zeno's paradoxes of the flying arrow or Achilles okay it denies the reality of motion and continuity of something else which is actually going forward in any evolutionary sense okay so intelligence then becomes attached to positions of movement in relation to its home of objects uh, as opposed to the progress through which it passes from one position to another progress you know, being of growth and movement, okay? So intelligence is that thing that grasps and focuses on the harvest, on the product, on that which it can grab as opposed to production, communication, relationality, progress, growth. Intelligence always wants a result. It wants the result, okay? It does not, it's not interested in becoming, your, uh, in becoming or germination or growth. It's only really interested in the notion, in the notion of that which has already become, okay? So... The author turns to the Gospel of St. John in talking about the idea that the human soul needs to transpose its intelligence from autumn to springtime. Now, autumn being the time when things are realized, okay? That's like, it's like done, okay, we have results, everything's become. So in transposing our soul to springtime, we transpose our soul into a time when we, we, we're really in communication with germination and rejuvenation, the actual becoming itself. And this is a conjunction of the sun and the moon it, when he goes a little bit into astrology. But the intelligence needs to accept that there is nothing new under the sun. Okay, it's in, in this in this ever searching for results and the and the become and products, it's almost like tempting to find something new. And it needs to adapt itself to pure and simple creativity, which is expressed by this metaphor of spring. Because in its original sense that we've been talking about, intelligence enters into a natural incomprehension of life, okay? It can't understand the word, capital W, the word of the Lord, which is at the heart of life, which is in relation to creativity, creation, and springtime. And in doing so, it has to make a leap. And it, we spoke about this leap a little bit with the star. It needs to make a leap from become to becoming, uh, from product to production, in order to accomplish a birth of the new which will which will always be there, but it will never have because it it just keeps on trying to grasp it, and it's not new if you grasp it. Okay, you, you just have to you have to you know you have to find yourself in accordance with that higher thing. And so once we've ascertained that the intellect is characterized by this natural inability to comprehend life because it's always just grasping onto it and not allowing life to be life, we can then turn to the ideas of the instinct. Okay, so the instinct um, is is that which becomes conscious of itself, capable of reflecting upon its object whilst expanding it back into a unification with like a sympathy with it. You know, it's a reciprocal relationship, okay? This, this active sympathy that the subject uh, has in principle, which extends to the matter and reflects back upon itself, is the development of an instinct, and this transforms into an intuition, okay? So this intuition um, then is, is the intellect which has put at its disposal, disposal the instinct. It's a vow of obedience made by the intelligence to that which transcends it and goes beyond it. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about intuition. A gradual transformation of the organ of formal knowledge into an organ of material knowledge in relation to an obedience of that higher thing. Okay. Um, and it, and it, you know, it makes other vows. I mean, intelligence is making a vow of poverty in relation to its own sort of strength, in relation to something which transcends it. It's not something the intelligence ever wants to do, to say, this thing just gets it better than me, because it's not knowing, it's not knowledge, it's rendering it over to it in that intuitive sense. And in this sense, intelligence ultimately ends up in conversation with an unconscious, capital W, wisdom. And initially, they have so little in common that communication between them is reduced to dreams. Okay, where there is uh, intelligence itself becomes passive, it's two languages. But in the waking state, however, this comes through once once the intelligence renders this obedience stronger, um, it comes through in, uh, in the development of conscience and the understanding of symbols. Uh, and, and, and that's where the domain of action with respect to this intelligence is. Okay, so what's happening here is the intelligence renders itself obedient to something higher and thus enters into intuition this intu intuition eventually allows uh, the the intelligence to have a communication with a deeper wisdom and this communication between these two the intelligence and the wisdom develops a conscience and the conscience is ultimately that door 
as in door to go through, is a door to a world of depth far more deep than we've ever envisaged. envisaged. But due to that relationship with intu intuition from legitimize something higher, it's clearly a safe passage uh, in the fact that the consciousness is being slowly developed in relation once again to that spiral that we saw before. Okay, so this intuition, which then reveals this, this depth world, is nothing more than intelligence which has, has submitted itself in an act of poverty to consciousness, uh, sorry, in, to conscience, from the point of view of actually being one with it eventually. So we can't pass from these two worlds, from one to the other, um, without with with without this act of sacrifice. The intelligence needs to almost sacrifice itself to something higher, to the conscience. So the card, in the sense of this, is, is, is about decision. Between rising above the form of grasping the world in relation to the crayfish, which is like stagnant and... Um, is retreated back from that form of intelligence which wants to give itself over. You know, it's it's lingering in the, the pool of below where the moon's eclipsing water has enfolded it and caught it. And, um, or choose the way of what the author calls the eagle, which rises above and begins a relationship with the higher wisdom, uh, that's which is above intelligence and then begins that big relationship where they all sort of merge. Okay, so the intelligence doesn't look for the efficient cause of the world in the heights of its own creative consciousness, but rather in the depths of with wisdom, which themselves are actually legitimately brought from above. Two very uh, peculiar, quite dry in the actual text, and obscure cards. And I hope I've made them somewhat palatable. I mean, the main, the two threads really are the same, just with respect to what happens when there's light, what happens when there's eclipse. Um, but yeah, thank you all once again for watching. I hope you've enjoyed these. These are, of course, the free ones. So if you hadn't have enjoyed them and you want access to uh, all of the talks, then please find links in the description below for the Patreon. Otherwise, see you in the next talk.